Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman, and I'm pleased to be here to welcome Garrett Hongo to our virtual stage. Um, tonight's author was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize uh, for the poetry collection, The River of Heaven. His other books of poetry include Yellow Light and Coral Road. Uh, the distinguished professor in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Oregon, uh, and a regular contributor to Soundstage Ultra. Uh, Mr. Hongo also authored Volcano, a memoir of Hawaii, and The Mirror Diary, selected essays. He joins us tonight with The Perfect Sound, a memoir in stereo, writing about his lifelong passion for sound reproduction equipment, which I could tell the moment he came on our screen here uh, with, with his background and, and what he was talking about with Major. Uh, it, this, this book is about his lifelong passion for sound reproduction equipment, music in many formats, poetic voices that have influenced him the most. And it's a celebration, uh, plainly speaking, of all things audio. Uh, I read a lovely review uh, that, that said, Hongo delivers a memorable memoir on reflection and artistry as rendered through his audiophile tendencies as he describes in lyrical, fervent passages his penchant for spinning vinyl on cheap turntables would eventually become a love for elaborate equipment, amplifiers, uh, amplifiers, speakers, and vacuum tubes. Uh, he'll be in conversation with Major Jackson, the Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Chair in, this, in the Humanities at Vanderbilt University. Uh, he's the poetry editor of the Harvard Review, and he is the author of five books of poetry, including The Absurd Man and Leaving Saturn. His many honors include the Cave Canem Poetry Prize, a Whiting Writers Award, and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. He has published poems and essays in a wide variety of periodicals, including the New Yorker, Paris Review, and my beloved Plowshares. Uh, so without further ado, Garrett, Major, thank you both so much for being here. And uh, take it away. The screen is all yours. Have at it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well. What a delight uh, to speak with um, my friend, uh, former teacher, uh, mentor, Garrett Hongo about um, music. And we're gonna take that phrase, that term, several different directions, I believe. Um, Garrett is going to kind of read, but before, before the reading, I just wanna say, Garrett, you know, First of all, congratulations. It's a deeply absorptive and charming book full of your, um, your intelligence, almost an accumulative uh, uh, sweep of, of your, your walk on this earth, man, particularly in sound. And I'm, I'm sure that it's going to join those uh, great music memoirs, uh, except from, uh, from an avid listeners uh, perspective um, a confession it took me a while to read the book and not because it's it's thick but because I kept quite joyously actually um, interrupting my reading with a sudden urge to want to either Spotify or YouTube search uh oh Spotify hey hey I know I know I know <laughs> uh, music that was um, unfamiliar to me, or in the case of Stravinsky and Billie Holiday and Glenn Gold and many others, revisit those albums that have, as we say, gone bone deep. Um, and I, it occurred to me after reading the book, I said to myself, this is, this is probably how Garrett lives every day. How much of your waking hours is spent listening to music? Well, you, I, 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 I... I feel I feel kind of on the spot answering that question a lot. I would say at least three hours a day. Um, mm. I don't, you know, Zen meditate anymore, but uh, mm. about equal to when I used to meditate. You know, uh, I don't get up and play music in the. Well, I don't. I wait a minute. I do. I have a little sound. Yes, bar. you do. You stayed at my house a couple of summers ago. Yeah, <laughs> you had music right. playing. In the shower, I yeah, heard I travel it. <laughs> with a little sound bar just to get me going. I play old, old school rhythm and blues and stuff. Yeah, but uh, uh, I don't listen to my system until the mid or late afternoon and or after dinner, and then I spend a, at least two three hours. Mm. And sometimes I read, but mostly I just listen. Mm -hmm. I was just listening to uh, 
a Vivaldi concerto before we got hopped on here. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, via a new uh, tone arm I just got from England. And so, it's, you know, it was really great. Yeah. It was yeah. really, you know, <laughs> great. Vivaldi and many other, um, many other musicians come into the book, but I'm also thinking about um, how the book is not just about your journey. It's an homage to a community of family members, your brother, your father, of course, who kind of modeled uh, a passion for, um, for music systems. Um, writer friends, fellow audiophiles appear in the book. Um, all of that prompted me to remember how much music uh, binds us. I, I recall some of our own uh, particular passions. I think at Breadloaf, you uh, recruited me. We didn't, I don't think we did it, but I think you recruited me to sing uh, Coltrane uh, at one point. You and I were at a VFW um, uh, bar in Eugene listening to some music. That was uh, terrific. But uh, yeah, I, I just feel like music, maybe even more so than food sometimes. It's the same, uh, yeah? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. for me, you live off of it, you know, you live in it. Um, and it's, it is more like good food, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I care about it, I care about it. I mean, I break off, you know, to tell people I gotta make dinner for Aunt Elena, you dig? And it's really important, you know? Yeah. So this Pauline is my 16 year old daughter. Um, and I consider it inviolable, you know, you always prepare dinner, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's how we create the family, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, um, let me hear a few, a few pieces from the book so we can get folks in the room. I'll, I'll just read from the overture, which I call Preludio. Mm -hmm. It's in the book. And in fact, it, the frontispiece piece to the book is the same as what everyone's seeing behind me now, my audio system. So here's the first few uh, sentences of the book. From here in my stereo room, in my day basement, 10 steps down from my entry hallway, much can seem perfect if I close my eyes and just listen. I've all my gear arranged in front of me, across the immaculate midnight blue Chinese carpet and against the acoustic panel wall opposite where I sit in my leather club chair, an acquisition from Pottery Barn during my middle age bachelor days. So much born of savings and sacrifice, but I hardly care since the sound here is so gorgeous, it lifts me out of things into a few, pure fabric of wonderment, adrift amidst all the sublime welter of notes. I start with piano music in the morning Mozart or Beethoven concertos performed by the likes of Alfred Brendel or Claudio Arau. Their right hand runs so liquidness across the keyboard, it's as though a clear water of crystalline singing were running over a stream bed of orchestral accompaniment. I glance at the gleaming enameling on my speakers, browse high piano black towers that mirror the inset ceiling lights when I switch them on. And I begin to want to flutter my hands like seabirds barely aloft over a dance line of shore break waves and indulge myself in this rapturous sequestration with music all around me. That uh, phrase, a pure fabric of wonderment. Um, as someone familiar with your poetry, I know that that's one of the, what's at stake, or at least that's part of what the quest is. Um, how, how does that wonderment factor into the journey towards a perfect, a perfect sound in, in, your, in your mind? You mentioned the sublime, and I'm curious about how music mediates or takes, or as, as the church says, takes us there. Uh... Well, it reconnects us to the joy of life, you know. Um, probably as children, we just are born with it, you know. Uh, 
I look at old pictures of my daughter and she's always bursting apart with joy. Mm. And um, then life brings its blows, you dig. Mm. And I think music, like um, many other arts, bring us back to it and enlarges it, in some ways darkens it, deepens it, allows it to accept just the tragedies of life too, and, and, and create something that is very special, very um, inspiring, right? Mm -hmm. And confirming as well of the, our better natures, uh, as John Keats might say. And, and I think that's why I, I love it so much. I mean, no matter what kind of music it is, I mean, as, as you know, in the book, we're talking about, you know, romantic music. We're talking about classical stuff from Haydn and Mozart. I listen to the lyre from, you know, primitive, you know, prehistoric uh, transcriptions of notes and stuff. I listen to rhythm blues a lot and jazz, you know. Um, I listen to everything, you know, I think. On, on Hawaiian music, I still, uh, last night before I played, um, what was I uh, saying, Johnny Hartman and John Coltrane, I was listening to Gabby Pahinui. Um, and his Hawaiian band singing Hawaiian songs. And it's, it's, it's not all the same to me, but I get feelings from it all, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And, and the, the thing that my hobby, my audio hobby allows me to do is not to treat it as background, mm. that it's mm. part of me, part of real life. And mm -hmm. in the search and the questing of my book, you know, there are at least two of them. One is to create a good audio system to play, of all things, opera. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, it's also to connect back with those different moments of my life that also inspired me. Like when I first heard a, um, a Hawaiian steel guitar, when I first um, heard the priest chant at the Kahuku, Kahuku Betsuin, when I was running around uh, South Bay LA with my first girlfriend um, mm -hmm. in high school and she was telling me about, you know, Rilke mm -hmm. and Hermann Hess and Joni Mitchell, you know, mm -hmm. and hipping me as, as it were. When I'm driving around LA, just before I leave for Japan, after I finish college, I hear Coltrane come on the radio on the FM, you know, and he's playing Equinox. All of a sudden, I understand Walt Whitman. <laughs> oh, that's what that old fuck is doing. He's just doing Coltrane, except he did it a hundred years earlier. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a moment in which, as I said, there's so many folks that come in and out of this, uh, fellow audiophiles, uh, your, your writer friend, your brother, quite movingly. Uh, there's a moment in which you narrate at, at McDowell Artist Colony, walking with, uh, Etheridge Knight, oh, yeah. and Etheridge, you, you go to visit him, and he is singing Willow Weep for Me, um, a song that I think you say you weren't familiar with. At yeah, the time. I didn't know it then. But the spirit of it, he, em he embodied that. Um, could you talk about, about that, that moment of walking in? Because I think it's back is to you he doesn't he's not aware that you're there he he's standing um he was in a studio where you could open the front door and the back door it's like a shotgun you dig mm -hmm. and then he was using the the uh outhouse which was detached as a echo chamber to amplify his voice you know he opened the door i mean the front door was closed but the back door was open etheridge was standing in it and singing into the bathroom or the outhouse actually. And it was, you know, it was just outside. It wasn't a, you know, and I opened the door when he didn't answer, you know, a knock and then I opened the door and there's Etheridge said, Willow weep for me. I mean, it was like he was lifting it from the ground. Willow weep for me. He had a very deep baritone and it would, it would resonate, you know, from his body. And he had a body like a linebacker, you know? So it really looked like he was coming up from the earth with it. And it just blasted me with this incredible feeling. And then, you know, we started talking a little bit and walking around. Um, 
I've heard other versions of that song since, but none of them match the way Etheridge was singing it. Um, the way he sang it was more bluesy, more dirge-like, mm -hmm. very powerful. Mm -hmm. If you ever heard Paul Robeson sing Old Man River, oh yeah, it was like that. It mm -hmm. was like that. He did it real slow and stately mm -hmm. and powerfully, you know? And you think that's because he, you know, for those who are not familiar with Etheridge Knight and no shame in that, but, um, you know, this was someone who lived a hard life, who served in Korea, um, addiction, something about that, that song in relationship to his life and being aware of it. When I read it, it made it even more kind of poignant. Well, Etheridge was connected to the blues, you know, in a very, very uh, primary way. He had it in his soul. I mean, he had a lot of spirit in his body. He had joy as well. And he was an elder I looked up to since I was, what, 20, 21 years old when I first read his poems. And then I mm -hmm. met him when I was 23. Mm -hmm. You know, I really looked up to him. He had studied with Gwendolyn Brooks through correspondence when he was in Indiana State Penitentiary. Um, and he'd just been released from prison when I met him. Mm. You know, so he was full of real joy to being free. And he, he, he I don't know, he, he kind of went out of his way to put his hand on my shoulder and tell me I was okay. You know, I appreciated that. And uh, um, it, it was always easy uh, with him and me, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he's like an older brother. And uh, he would tell me things like he, I asked him in that chapter that I write about. I said, well, what's the difference between hog calling and field hollers? And he would yell them for me. <laughs> he would do a hog call for me, uh, like calling the pigs home. And then he would then he he said that and field hollers were, were similar, but but they were more um, about Oh, you know, he said they grew out of slaves calling to each other from field to field. And they had a different feeling to it than, than just calling in the pigs. Mm. And then he talked about chain gang stuff, you know, and we talked about all that. He, he said he'd never been, of course, on a chain gang, but he had heard the Alan Lomax recordings. Mm. And he said he certainly felt them and um, how they had the rhythm of work to them. He had a lot of soul. Etheridge was a great teacher. Uh, you know, he told me about the prison thing they did in, called Toasts, which is like oral uh, rhyme poetry. Mm -hmm. They battle each other in the uh, Indiana State Federal Penitentiary. Uh, State Penitentiary was built like La Scala, I swear to God. <laughs> you know, they had these tiers of, of cells, right? Just like the box seats in La Scala. And you would sing down into the well which would then echo back. So he said they could sing all their toasts into the well and, you know, nobody could beat Etheridge, right? Right, Together. right, right. <laughs> so he told me about, um, he, that's when he recited Shine, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't know. I miss him. I'm grateful to him. He's a leader. Yeah. And he did this wonderful moment. And that's also in the book when, I brought Etheridge to Michigan. I was a graduate student. I was like you at the Painted Bride. I bring who I wanted, you know. Mm. I brought Etheridge, Leslie Silko, um, Lawson Inada, and Mae Mae Bursenbrugge to do a reading at the Black fraternity called the Trotter House because English department, of course, would not sponsor such a thing back in those days. Mm -hmm. And I had invited Robert Hayden to read, who had been a teacher of mine in the, in the fall. And he declined coming because he said that you he said you would not enjoy the audience you deserve were I to appear on the podium with you I said what and he said I am I'm afraid I am persona non grata at the Trotter house and what he was talking about is having been canceled by the black arts movement and Melvin Tolson and the Miri Baraka people denouncing him for being too much like the man Mm -hmm. for having been a student of Auden, for writing rhyme poetry, for being a learned, not only 
consciousness, but in his persona. He was very, very bookish. He wore bow ties and he had these coat bottle glasses. He looked very, very, you know, bookish. And uh, he was wrong. Like, I didn't know this at the time, but he said that it would cancel the audience if he was on the podium, but he said he would come. So I reserve seats, places packed, you know. Uh, we had just successfully <clears throat> renegotiated with administration to re reinstate financial aid to African-American students. We had been on mm -hmm. strike about it. So it was a celebration of our victory. And then uh, Robert Hayden walks in with his wife and then shuffles into the second row where I had the reserved seats. Etheridge stood up and said, I want you all to know the great Robert Hayden has graced us with his presence. And he started clapping and then other writers stood up and applauded and the whole room stood up. It, it made me cry. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's the way Etheridge was. Right, right. You know. You're um, you're mentioning Hayden and Etheridge, or my mentioning Etheridge, takes me to something I've always said to students about your work is that there's, there's a lushness with your sentence. I mean, both in your poems and your prose and um, I compare it to using the sentence as a, a moment of composition where the syntax is soloing through the kind of turns and phrases of thoughts. I mean, it's just, it's just there. And I was wondering about the relationship between music and your art, your artistry. How, how has music cultivated your ear as a writer? Well, you know, from early on, I think I had to be, have, I had to have a, flexible ear because I grew mm. up speaking Hawaiian pidgin English right mm -hmm. as a child and then um, I was asked to learn to speak uh, proper English standard English um, and of course I heard Japanese being spoken in the home by my grandparents who partly raised me and then out in the you know I, I grew up hearing Hawaiian Hawaiian language you know and it's Hawaiian songs then in LA I picked up you know what we used to call black jab speech, you know, because mm -hmm. that's the way everyone spoke. It, it's very similar to the way Charlie Mingus spoke and Stanley Crouch, who was one of my early teachers as well. And um, because of all those different influences, but I'm also reading, you know, John Keats and Shakespeare and Whitman, and um, it became very, very flexible and kind of expansive. Mm -hmm. And as an artist, you know, you want to sound like nobody else. You, you want to create something that's your own, right? And one of the things I was able to do was to create a long line in poetry, but an extraordinarily supple and extended um, syntax within the sentence mm -hmm. to carry not only meaning, but a kind of music. And, uh, you know, I kind of made a study of things like I've, I have to admit my early teachers in poetry, Charles Wright and, um, C.K. Williams are also known for the long line, um, in some ways lavish imagery, especially Charles, but Derek Walcott, you know, as you know very well. So those were the, those were in some ways the models. And I said, well, what can I do within this? And I took the sort of hints and, and glints of insight from um, what I knew about soloing, as you say, from jazz. And I remember lessons that Stanley gave us when we were young about you having to know the roots of the music, which it was for him the blues, mm -hmm. and then being able to extend it to create your own song within, mm -hmm. but have the basis still be of what he talked about in the mud, you know, mm -hmm. on the ground. So I, I remember his lesson on um, Cecil Taylor the avant-garde pianist who he attacked later on, <laughs> but who, who, who he much admired when I was a student, the avant-garde pianist. He said, before you start pounding the keys like Cecil Taylor, you gotta be able to groove, you know, like Louis Armstrong. So he put all that together as a principle of artistry very early on. As a matter of fact, I'll make a confession. Somewhat five years ago, seven years ago, I'm reading Stanley's biography of Charlie Parker, Kansas City Lightning, and about Parker's woodshedding, you know, 
after he got booed from the from the, from right. the grandstand. <laughs> He comes back two years later, all of a sudden he's a monster. He's Charlie Parker, you know. He says, this is what we all have to do. We got to take our lumps and we got to woodshed. And then we got to bring what is monstrous within us into, the, into our art. And I'm, re I'm reading all this and I'm thinking, this is what I've been thinking all along. Where the hell? I thought these were my ideas. <laughs> they came from Stanley Crouch. <laughs> Um, I, I mentioned earlier, my experience of reading the book was interrupting um, and mainly to, again, find the music that you were referencing. Uh, why haven't I listened to the Allman Brothers live at Fillmore before? That blew me away. I mean, there was, there was a lot here that blew me away. Some of the um, uh, Brahms pieces that you um, reference. And, and I listen to a lot of classical. As a writer, I, I, need, I need the music, but it has to not have words. Um, your, your intersectionality of music and writing and culture is really um, one of the great highlights here. And you, you talk about hearing for the first time, you talk about a lot hearing for the first time, but one of them that's quite memorable is hearing Aretha Franklin. Yeah, uh, I think I was freshman year in high school. Um, I'm in the, sitting in the bleachers watching a track meet. And um, for some reason, I was, the, my school was uh, one third Japanese American, one third African American, and sort of one third white. Um, and there are Mexican Americans among us as well. And they, they usually actually, strangely enough, associated with the white students, you know, in those days. Mm. So, so I didn't sit with the Japanese American students that day. I sat closer to the band, which was right next to African American students. And I remember there was a woman with a girl with a record player that was portable, you know, one of those things that ran on D batteries. And so they were playing this 45 and ding, 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 what's it? It was just jumping. And they were, they all the, the girls were in this line and they were all doing the hand gestures and rocking in the, in the seats like this, you know? And this music just, wow, blew up in my head. And it was uh, Aretha's uh, R-E-S-P-C-T, the cover of Otis Redding's song, you know? Mm -hmm. Not many people know that it was a cover, that it was Otis Redding. <laughs> and um, I didn't know this at the time. I mean, I didn't know anything. But uh, I just immediately, I'm like, what is that? I actually made her show me the record. You know, the first time I ever saw the Atlantic label, you know, that red and black label. And I went out and got it right away. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it, it kind of mesmerized me as did those girls because it was also an extremely sexy gig, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were just shaking away, man. It was just so much fun. I forgot about the track meet. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and you know, Dwayne Allman is 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 playing the guitar. That that's I Dwayne Allman. That is crazy. Dwayne Allman yeah. on that guitar. That riff thing. That's Dwayne yeah. Allman, and 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 King Curtis on saxophone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The um, it's quite actually um another compelling aspect of of the book is. The music takes you to other cultures and maybe even gives you permission to kind of feel in ways that um, culturally, I won't say denied, but there was something liberatory about it. Um, when you you narrate dating a young 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 woman in your high school, and she brings Roka into your life. And she brings Joni Mitchell. And your right. description of both Roca and Joni Mitchell is probably some of the best description I've heard. Thank you. No, truly. I I was, I was, I don't know if she brought it out in you or you brought it out in her, and, and it's been this indelible like experience. Well, well, but. The lady lit me up, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, it was junior in high school. I had broken my foot and I couldn't play football. So I, instead of football practice, 
and weightlifting, I had to take some of the kind of credit. So I, mm. I ended up in creative writing because it was the only class that you could still get into because nobody wanted to do that, mm -hmm. you know. And so, um, plus, it was a multi-ethnic, you know, everybody was in it, like every, you know, white people, Mexican-Americans, you know, maybe two other Japanese girls were on the other side of the room and me. Mm -hmm. And I, I got seated between, uh, well, behind Alina, I call her in the book, I changed her name, <laughs> you know, and and uh, Philip Pacheco, oh, Felipe uh -oh. Garcia, yeah. <laughs> Felipe Garcia in the book, he was my Chicano friend, gay Chicano friend. And they hit me, man. Uh, and we used to talk very freely in class because our teacher said as long as we didn't get too rowdy, he would just leave us alone. And he would study his chess books. You know, it was his last year before he retired or whatever. So, you know, we, we did some writing, but, you know, Alina would snap these books on my table. First thing she did was she said, you sound like this guy in this book. And it was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, a paperback. And Keezy. And uh, I go, what guy? Because well, actually, two guys. I said, what do you mean, two guys? He goes, one is uh, McMurphy, and the other is the chief. I said, what do you mean, the chief? Because he's he's a he's a Native American. He didn't, he didn't say that, but I go, wait, I don't get it. What is this book? It's about guys in prison, and it's a she said prison, but it was a mental institution. So I read the book over the weekend because you know I want to catch up to her, right? So I'm all ready to talk. I said, wait a minute. She says, I'm like, chief, I don't say anything. Because I had two persona. I was lit when I was talking to her, but in class, Japanese American kids had to be totally silent. So I had that side of me as well. And I realized that what she was bringing out was a some more boisterous, um, buoyant side of my of my soul. So we started hanging out after school because her house was right on my way home. So I walk her home and we one thing led to another. She started hitting me with the hitting me with the music she had, which was white covers, British uh, British rockers covering uh, black blues. Mm -hmm. So she had I got my mojo working by the zombies actually. She had going out of my head by the zombies because her brother had been shipping all these 45s from England where the white groups in England were covering black rhythm and blues and blues. So that's how I started getting into that. I was getting into Alina, you know, we were, you know, getting together and then she would, she would read Rilke to me on the beach where we go to the beach. And uh, one day I, 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 I was late. I had to do something after school. I don't remember, but I, I caught up to her. She was already home. And she was crying, sitting on her living room floor crying. And I thought something was wrong. She, she was just listening to a Joni Mitchell record. And I never heard anybody cry to music before. So it was very powerful and mysterious and strange. And I, uh, you know, I fell into listening carefully to Joni Mitchell with her. And that sort of became our songs, right? And that was Joni Mitchell's first album, Song to a Seagull. And it's just, you know, a knockout piece of art. And uh, it got into my soul very early at the same time that Roca did because of her, um, well, you know, her teaching me as it were, yeah. like Etheridge taught me, you know. Yeah. I think one of the things you talk about in the book is I love being taught. I love being tutored. Mm -hmm. um, I love learning more about the world. As far as the comment about intersectionality, you know, as a kid, I grew up in Hawaii and we all related to each other, Japanese to Native Hawaiians or Kanaka Oevi, as we say, um, Portuguese people. Um, and it wasn't, there wasn't so much in the way of, of relating to each other. So I wanted instinctively to keep doing it through high school, mm. even though it was prohibited, you know. So I dated Alina and uh, we couldn't go to the white dances, we couldn't go to the Japanese dances because it was so segregated. So um, our friend Felipe Garcia says, come to the Chicano dances, I'll disguise you. He would dress us up. And, and you know, because Alina was dark, you know, kind of. And, you know, I look like I look. So he said, just we'll put a little wax on your you know, mustache. We'll, we'll trace flores your hair. And then he taught us all these dances, Mexican dances. So that's where we would go. And, um, you know, 
I got it. I got familiarized more with Chicano culture that way as well. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that, uh, you know, that that story ends a little tragically with Alina, which is um, when your friends find out and her friends find out uh, that you're dating each other. Um, there's there is there's a fight breaks out, you know, people are policing. And the music doesn't do that, right? The music allows us to kind of cross those boundaries, much like all, um, all art. Speaking of crossing boundaries, all right, I'm a big Maria Callas fan, but, and maybe, and, and maybe, oh, watch it now, watch it, I know. And maybe Pavarotti here and there. What's with your I was love playing Callas last night. Where are you? Like Gabby Pahinui, Maria Callas, Johnny Hartman and John Coltrane. That's what, exactly what I played last night. Gary, why don't you just give us a playlist and get it over with? You should have <laughs> put that in the back of the book. You know, give us a playlist to read with the book. Your love of opera is, is palpable and throughout the book. And I'm, I'm curious about uh, your grandmother took you to a concert. Is that where it began? No, it was a chamber music concert she took chamber me to. Concert. It was yeah. uh, Brahms, right? Yasha yeah. Kessler and... Uh, uh, Gregor Piatagorsky and uh, Leonard Primrose playing uh, chamber music. I think one of the things I may have played was uh, a Brahms quintet and then a uh, the Mendelssohn octet, but I wouldn't have known that then. I was, shoot, must have been 11 years old. Wow. You know, could have been 12. But I, it was anomalous in my experience until I started listening to chamber music in college. Um, opera happened. I'd always listen to CDs, like always. I mean, off and on, I would have a, you know, compilation of stuff, arias and stuff. And a couple of them I really loved, but I didn't know nothing. I'd gone to a few operas in LA and DC and, you know, I won't say that I responded cynically, but they didn't affect me. Um, one was Mozart, Cosi Fantute, and the other one was, um, what was that one? Oh, 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 La Forza del Destino, the Verde. I go to Italy in 2005, and one of the things that happened was I, I got into uh, La Scala. Uh, the consulate got me tickets, and uh, I went to, it was La Boheme, mm -hmm. and it just knocked me out. Uh, is there a difference hearing it live versus hearing a recording of it? There's a difference hearing it in Europe than hearing it in America. <laughs> the, the, this is the way you hear up a small instrument houses. You know, the mat, those places are too big. They're just, they don't get you the, the feeling. They may get you the splendor. They may get you the spectacle. But in Italy, La Scana is actually quite small and intimate. And it goes higher up than it goes horizontal you dig mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so they're like there's these archangels above you mm -hmm. you know sitting in their boxes and the orchestra is like in your lap i had mid-hall orchestra seats and it felt like the orchestra was in my lap and then the singers are right there it's like you're getting your own concert and they're fantastic they're the most great the greatest singers in the in the universe and the music the puccini the the story of these artists struggling in the Latin Quarter of Paris, you know, trying to make it, you know, it just, that story is, all of our stories as artists or hopeful writers and painters and composers and philosophers. And the ardor, the passion, the sort of idealism, optimism of the apprentice artists was just so moving to me. It reminded me of myself and my friends when we were young. It, it reminded me of, of um, Alina. It reminded me of my friend Ed Hirsch when we first met. Mm -hmm. And and I, I just the thought- MLA that, conference, no less. <laughs> I, that's Sorry. right. I just <laughs> thought- operatic well, place. <laughs> so it was so moving. Um, yeah. And this aria that Rodolfo sings, you know, Que Gelida Manina, as he's holding Mimi's hands in his, and then Mimi answering back about how she wakes to the dawn, to the rising sun, and puts up flowers in a small um, glass. It's just so fantastic. And then they do a duet, you know, O Suave Fanchula, I adore, you know, you lovely thing. And it, it, 
and then the the stage setting with the paper moon rising over the set it just killed me i'm weeping before the end of the first act i'm shuddering with passion you know and i i i was so moved i literally fell asleep i like swooned and i, I didn't wake up until the horns blared for the opening of the second act you know and um so i came back to eugene and said i got to get a stereo that can play this shit so i can figure it out because the poetry was so grand the music was so you know moving i thought it was the greatest art form ever first thing that happened is my stereo broke the cd changer broke it i went what you know i tried to get it fixed it couldn't get fixed because you know it was so cheap they would it you, they wouldn't bother and i call up a friend who's an audio file end up buying his old cd player which is this huge thing you know i couldn't believe it anything would be dedicated just to play one cd i put it on and, and just by accident it was an ellington cd i don't know why i did that not opera but i put on an ellington and it was like whoa there's a miniature ellington orchestra in my house man what the hell you know it was just so gorgeous i i just flipped out i said okay 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 I got to get a really good speakers now. I got to get a really good amplifier now. I got to really get tower speakers now. What the hell? I got to get tube amplifiers. <laughs> I just went nuts. Speaking Until of, I finally um, got to where I needed to be. That that sends you on your quest, and I I just geez, the time goes really fast. Um, I want to I want to ask some questions that are here, and I have several several other questions, but I want to ask someone asked, are those Bowers and Wilkins speakers or pitcher Bowers and Wilkins speakers? Do you, behind you? They are a brand called Ascendo. They're spelled just like Ascendo, but they want you to pronounce it with a K. Mm -hmm. They're made in Germany and they're very um, unusual. Mm -hmm. They have very long ribbon tweeters and a very large uh, mid-range um, driver. Uh, I had to get them because my old speakers, which are also magnificent, were just not enough to fill the room that I have now, which is a lot larger than my prior room. So I needed to get a speaker that would be A, refined enough to play uh, operatic music, particularly sopranos and tenors, but also powerful enough to amplify and fill the room with bass, the foundation of, of the sound you know, of an orchestra. Um, also, if you listen to jazz or rock and roll, like cream or whatever, you know, you got to have that bass. Mm -hmm. And so this combines a very, uh, like a, a 15 inch woofer, which is a bass in the bass cabinet, uh, an eight inch uh, mid range, and a, what is it, almost a, a nine inch ribbon tweeter. Uh, and they weigh 270 pounds each. You know, so they're kind of special. They were, I actually had to search the world for them. Mm -hmm. They, there was a pair in Mumbai, a pair in Istanbul, and a pair in Corsica. But luck, I lucked out at a pair in Brooklyn. But after searching a year for them, a, a seller in Portland, Oregon popped up. How about those? Uh, they're made in Germany, and they're about 12 years old now. So you, you, they're still in production. Yeah. Uh, you can buy a pair, but they're not cheap. I don't want to say how much they are. Yeah, <laughs> I had two questions here um, by two different folks. Um, someone asked us to take us on a tour of your stereo system and what makes it so fine. And our, our friend, Mr. Tillinghast, um, asked, well, with all the range of references, musical and autobiographical and cultural, what is your opinion of Norma? You mean the opera? I'm assuming he means the, yeah. the Bellini. Yeah. Well, it has the great aria Casta Diva in it, um, which is priceless. Um, I mean, it's one of the grandest arias in the repertoire. As a play, it's worth attending. It's worth knowing. Um, if you only listen to the highlights, it won't give you the great um, movement 
of the mm -hmm. drama. Mm -hmm. I think it's always important not, not to read only anthology pieces in poetry, but to read a whole book. It's even more important with opera to actually experience the entire opera. So even though you can pull Casta Diva from it, you can think of bel canto and the finest of singing. It's 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 somehow more. I don't know. Artistic to take in the entirety of the opera itself, mm. you know. And there are wonderful versions of it. You know, um, um, Maria Callas has a recording with uh, uh, Tulio Serafin conducting the orchestra, which I recommend. It sound is not great. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, I can't name who who most recently recorded the whole thing. I'm I'm sorry, it slips my mind. Yeah, you know, but I do adore it, and uh, it's it's Italian opera. What can be be bad? <laughs> my son and I, Romy, uh, last summer was in Greece, and we had one day. We were driving up from the Pelop driving up from near Sparta on our way back to Athens. And I said, Romy, we have to stop at Epidaurus. Ah. And it was so hot that yeah. they closed it early. And I found a way to kind of sneak in and almost got uh, got locked up by the Greek police. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> what a you, good story. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, two questions here. One of them is, um, how important is a venue? Do you have like favorite venues you like to go to? much in the same way that you you take great painstaking effort to create a, a space in which the music is as pure as if it was live. Uh, and you talk about that uh, quite a bit, but, but, and you talk about Epidaurus and you talk about, about um, uh, the amphitheater, the Greek yeah, the amphitheater. Uh, what what about what about venues that you've gone to over the years that where the music where the the production led at was as equally important as the musicians or the acoustics in the room? Well, La Scala, mm -hmm. you know, in opera, but also um, oh geez, you know, in America, I think San, the Santa Fe Opera is wonderful. It's a much larger scale, um, but its um, acoustics are very good, and the intimacy of the seating is also precious and special. It's outdoors. It's in that Santa Fe climate, you know. Um, I've not been to the uh, the Bastille in Paris, but the, but the Opera House in Paris is very lovely. Um, I want to go to the Royal uh, Opera House in London, but I haven't been. In jazz, the Village Vanguard in New York is still there, man. That's right. I mean, it's still there. You got to go. Everybody ought to go. Yeah. I heard Kenny Barron there at last. Um, before that, I heard um, uh, Ron Carter with, uh, with um, oh, come on. We were just talking about him. The guitar player on the bridge. Uh, oh, Sonny Rollins. No, he's a saxophone player, but the, his, what is it, his oh, the right guitar. Here? Oh. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I went there with Yusef Komanyaka and Suji uh, Kwa Kim, and it's a great venue for jazz. I used to go to Sweet Basil's with St. Clair Bourne, and uh, in San Francisco, well, in Oakland, there's Yoshi's, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. Bad Japanese restaurant, really great jazz. <laughs> 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 in uh, LA, man, I grew up at the Lighthouse, you know. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, now... This is, you're... <laughs> You, you, there are several mentors that you that you mentioned, but I, I want to go to your father because this, your father and your mom, your mom buys you pretty much a what is today would be called a boombox, or yesterday was called a boombox, and you get a transistor radio, and your dad, you know, is building his system when he's not at work, and there's a way in which there's a transference of this passion. Um, and this absorption and this, um, uh, what do you call it? This obsessing, <laughs> obsessions. Um, my grandfather took me to my very first concert. It was B.B. King outdoors in Philadelphia Fairmount Park. Um, I heard B.B. King at Via de Este in Lake Como on the 4th of <laughs> July. In Italy? In Italy. 
I was so excited. I called my brother up on a cell phone. My brother's a blues guitar player. I said, hey, Eldon, listen to this. And he goes, that's B.B. King. I said, yeah, guess where I am? He goes, I don't know. Chicago? I said, I'm in Italy, dude. It's Via de Este. How much is it? How much of this book is an homage to your folks and it's the whole thing, you know. Grandparents, um, yeah. For the longest time, I didn't understand my own obsession. I was very passionate about getting to a great stereo system and hearing the music the way I wanted. But along the way, I started remembering my father doing this, um, building his own systems at night back in the early 60s with the DIY or do it yourself kits he get in the mail, Keith Kit, Donna Kit. And then Back in those days, I was 10, 11, 12 years old. He would ask me to tell him what it sounded like. He would fiddle with it and ask me to t tell him because his hearing was failing. His, his ears got damaged during World War II. And so here I am at 10 or 11. I, I really didn't think anything of it. I mean, I would try to describe the music to him in Hawaiian pidgin English. That was my job, you know. But I loved it because I got to do something for my father of course, whom I looked up to. And we would just spend time together fiddling with his stereo. And then, you know, when by the time I got to be 15, 16, I started listening to my own records. You know, Albert King, B.B. Um, King Live at the Regal, um, John Mayall with Clapton and the Blues Breakers and stuff. And my brother would join me, you know. And uh, I just forgot about my father's devotion. When I started building my own stereo system, assembling it, all of a sudden, I realized dude was doing this mm. so he could listen to his own music for the last time in his life mm. before his hearing completely failed. And I was just knocked sideways, you know. I thought, what an incredible thing to do. What an incredible, lovely, passionate, and peaceful thing. And uh, I loved him even more. And... Uh, I started remembering more things, you know. So the the whole book is a kind of fulfillment of what you might call an artistic legacy my father gave me. Um, it was never an injunction. It was never what I would call a material legacy, mm. but it was like a spiritual legacy. Mm. So the quest was sort of to fulfill all the things he couldn't do which is to hear this great music, uh, to know it as much as anyone can. So in, many, in different parts of the book, I imagine my father during World War II between battles, you know, scrounging a phonograph and 78 records and sitting down and just playing Artie Shaw and listening to a whole side, you know, and uh, bringing home a, recording of the good, the bad, and the ugly in stereo and playing it, you know, yeah. and hearing that uh, Ennio Morricone orchestra playing that great music. It is an homage to my father. Um, it is an invocation and a recreation of his wish. Um, not only for, not for me, but for himself. And um, I talk about The last two chapters in the book are called Shoke, accession under the stars. And it means acceding to your family legacy, maturing within to accept the standing of the family. And as an immigrant, as a child of immigrants, um, that also becomes important because it's to embrace all of that history of displacement and diaspora, but try to create a spiritual through line through all the ancestors in my own time. So that I bring together that spiritual legacy as well as um, whatever I am existentially here. It's very important. We have time for one more question. 
comes from probably a friend who asks, um, would you consider learning how to play an instrument, perhaps to enhance your love of various music? Well, you know, it's the kind of the reverse. I mean, I was in a musical program until my mother discovered that I, you know, tested well. <laughs> so she yanked me out of um, guitar lessons, Hawaiian guitar. And uh, I got kicked out of a uh, boys choir because I was singing doo-wop with uh, a Japanese guy, a white guy, and a black guy. A black guy was our tutor. He would teach us things, you know, like swing low, precious mm -hmm. uh, Lord and stuff like that. Also in the still of the night, um, tonight, tonight. Um, so the stereo is kind of an expression of my frustration of not having become a musician, like my brother, who was a great blues guitarist. Mm -hmm. I mean, the man can play, you know. Um, he played Stormy Monday at our father's funeral. Um, I, 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 before I finished the book, I thought briefly about trying to take lessons in Hawaiian guitar, on um, buying a Hawaiian guitar. Um, and my our friend Terry Hummer encouraged me. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I have a little bit of ageism in me. I thought it's too late. You know, it's too late. <laughs> I got to confess. Uh, Garrett, thank you for this book. Thank you for. Um, uh, there's also something that we haven't talked about, which is how you go into the language and play the language itself, whether it's uh, the language that is spoken in Hawaii among um, your ancestors, your family. Uh, it's, it's a truly gorgeous book and touches on uh, so much. So I wanna thank you and thanks everyone for being here this evening and, and joining us. Well, thank you, Major. Thanks for um, being a great host and interlocutor and a great poet in your own right, a great man. Thank you.